All right, welcome to the American Academy of Emergency Medicine's Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion section presentation. This is the second installment of our mentorship webinar series. Um, tonight's topic is Representation Matters, Dermatologic Presentations on Darker Skin in the Emergency Department. My name is Kristen Fontes. My pronouns are she, her. I am a board-certified emergency physician, and I will be your speaker tonight. So this session is meant to be interactive. And um, while I'm here to teach, I love learning from other people as well. It actually makes me a better teacher. Um, but I also want to just be very transparent here and say that, you know, I'm, I'm a biracial person. So I have an experience with health disparities that affect my community. But I'm finding that as I go through my career, I'm constantly having to educate myself about health issues that affect um, other racial groups. And it's some, and some of that means I have to kind of unlearn things that I was taught previously. Um, it's a long-term process. I'm not the expert, um, but I want to hear from you. I'm excited to talk to you tonight. Um, we will have plenty of time at the end for questions, discussion. So if you have any that come up, feel free to use the chat. We do have Kathy from AAEM that will be um, sort of keeping track of that. Um, but like I said, there's going to be uh, time for discussion towards the end. Um, if you're also here to just listen, learn, reflect, that's okay too. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen again to show you my slides. Oops. Yeah. There we go. Okay, so this session is going to be dedicated to dermatologic presentations on darker skin in the emergency department. We have just under an hour here, so um, we're going to focus on common pathologies. We'll look at their associated inequities, and I'll also provide a set of resources that you can review at your convenience um, later on. I really appreciate everyone being here, whether you're here in attendance now or viewing this later. But before we start, I do think it's important to acknowledge that this session, while meant to be educational and in the interest of health equity, does include content about systemic racism, and that may be triggering. So if at any point you need to step away to take care of yourself, please, please do that. Um, your well-being is important to us. All right, another word of caution I need to advise is that while we will be discussing skin conditions that are more prevalent in certain racial groups and those conditions will look different in patients from different racial groups, we need to try and avoid thinking about race as a biological or genetic concept. Um, race is a construct, okay? And with that comes a system of multiple kinds of oppression for people of color and health disparities are just one example of that. Okay, so we'll, while we must acknowledge race for its role as a determinant of health, we really do need to move away from thinking that predisposition towards certain skin disorders is just something a patient is born with, like it's much more nuanced than that. Okay, um, the goal of this session is to show you what skin disorders look like in different racial groups and on different skin tones, um, and to connect these disorders to the non-biological inequities faced by these patients. Before we move forward, I want to just take a moment to say a huge thanks to Kara Gardner for putting together the majority of the slides you'll see tonight. Um, Kara is a medical student who's been very involved with AAEM Jedi um, and has been really instrumental in reaching out to engage medical students as our section grows, um, especially to those who are underrepresented in medicine. So thank you so much, Kara. Um, your work and your outreach are, are much needed and much appreciated. All right, so there we go. There we go. All right, so first, one of the issues we need to address is how our medical education system teaches us about skin pathology. So in 2018, a group of sociologists in Canada examined these four widely used medical textbooks. They looked at the Atlas of Human Anatomy, which is Denner's Base Guide to Physical Examination and History Taking, Clinically Oriented Anatomy, which is um, Moore's, and Gray's Anatomy for Students. And these authors looked at 4,146 images from these four textbooks looking at both race and skin tone. And what they found was that regarding race, 62.5% of the images were of white people, 20.4% were black, and 17% were other people of color. But here's what's most unacceptable. Of the skin tones represented, 74.5% of the images were of light skin, 21% were of medium skin, and only 4.5% of the images were of dark skin. 
I personally used three of these books on a regular basis as a medical student. I might have used all of them. I can't totally remember, but I do have to acknowledge now that this definitely helps create a bias that may contribute to disparities in my diagnosis and treatment of patients with dark skin. Um, so, you know, and most of us are taught in this way. So I think that's a really big reason why we need to talk about this and why it's important for people like me who have been out of medical school for a long time to really re-educate ourselves. All right, so let's explore a common presentation. We have a 15 year old young woman who presents to the emergency department with a complaint of dry skin. Um, she has a history of asthma and an allergy to peanuts. And on physical exam of the elbow that you can see over on the right there, the, the bottom portion of the image shows this large plaque that is erythematous and scaly. And then surrounding that area, you can see these tiny raised papules, all right? Looking at this image to me, I would imagine this patient is probably very itchy too. Now it might be hard to see erythema or redness on dark skin. And what may be more noticeable is what you can see here, which is sort of like a grayish brownish um, coloration to the plaque. It can also be violaceous or sort of have a more like a purplish color. Um, so make sure you take in all the findings when you're examining the skin. Take a feel of the plaque, which is probably going to have somewhat of a rougher texture. It's, that's called like kenification. Um, it may feel warm. It may feel swollen. And that's going to differ in texture compared to the papules surrounding that plaque, which are going to be more of like a rounded um, bump that's sort of smoother in texture. Now, with this particular condition, these papules are much more likely to appear on dark skin. All right. So we're dealing with atopic dermatitis here, um, commonly referred to as eczema. And this is a chronic inflammatory skin disorder that is one of the top five skin disorders that are seen in Black Americans who visit dermatology clinics. So these patients are being diagnosed by skin specialists. Um, if we look specifically at pediatric patients, it is most prevalent among Black children. Up to 20% of Black kids will have atopic dermatitis some point at some point in their childhood. Um, eczema is also among the top five skin disorders in Asian people. And as its name suggests, atopic dermatitis is part of a group of disorders known as atopy, which includes things like asthma, allergic rhinitis, like nasal allergy symptoms, and also um, food allergies. I mentioned itching earlier, and I wanna just spend a moment sitting with that. Okay, so while any patient with atopic dermatitis is likely to have itching and maybe some like burning pain as well, studies have shown that these symptoms tend to be worse in black patients because they tend to have more severe disease. So just think about that. Think about what it must feel like to have constant itching and pain, how that might affect someone's well-being, their quality of life, if they're suffering from severe symptoms every single day. Combine that with the deep-rooted trauma, chronic stress that so many Black Americans live with because of systemic racism. You know, I feel like I was taught as a student that eczema was this relatively benign condition that was pretty easy to treat, but it's taken some time seeing lots of patients who suffer from chronic eczema and just doing some additional self-study to better understand that this disorder really affects the whole patient. And, you know, especially when they have severe disease, um, so I just think it's important for people like me and other clinicians who are not Black to understand just how disabling this condition can be. All right. So chronic rubbing and scratching the skin that's affected by atopic dermatitis can actually lead to something called parigo nodularis. Um, this is just one of many complicating factors that are more likely to affect Black patients with atopic dermatitis. The lesions here are going to be firmer and nodular, meaning the, they, the nodules are raised, but they're a little bit larger in diameter than a papule. Um, and you can see there's also many excoriations on the tops of these lesions because it is intensely itchy. Um, it develops due to chronic itching and scratching, um, but they also are itchy themselves. So it creates this like cyclical problem that can be extremely difficult for patients to manage. All right, so atopic dermatitis is linked to systemic racism. I mentioned that there's a high prevalence in black children and guess what? Several factors have been found to be associated with more severe atopic dermatitis in black kids. Um, meaning that like, you know, it's not just that they have it, it's that these factors are associated with worse disease burden in these kids. So things like 
fewer educational opportunities for their parents that lead to things like lower income, living in rented homes, um, residential segregation. But it's important to remember that even with similar levels of education, Black people still tend to receive less income than their white counterparts. And so even that is going to contribute to the ongoing disparity with atopic dermatitis. I mentioned previously that atopic dermatitis can look different on different skin tones and also in patients from different racial groups. Um, shown here are two women with atopic dermatitis. On the left, we see a Black woman with a similar set of features um, to the image that I showed you at the beginning. So it's got this kind of lichenified or rough textured appearance and plaques that are hyperpigmented. I wanna spend a moment discussing hyperpigmentation. Um, this is a phenomenon that as part of the normal inflammatory process that happens with atopic dermatitis, more melanin is made and or distributed in the area of the rash and is more likely to occur in people with dark skin who have more melanin to begin with. So this is an important point. Um, don't just look for erythema when you're considering an inflammatory process leading to a skin rash or an eruption. Um, the absence of erythema should not reassure you. It should not, uh, and it does not rule out any potentially serious pathology. Um, so it's really important to learn to recognize the multiple ways that inflammation can present on the skin. And then on the right, we see an Asian woman with a more papular predominance. Um, the particular finding here isn't necessarily unique to any racial group, but what you should know is that atopic dermatitis can present in more subtle ways like this um, relative to some of the other images we've seen. Um, the symptoms will be similar, uh, but the rash itself may look very different. All right, here's one more image um, to demonstrate the difference between Asian people and white people. So relative to white people, if you look on the left, an Asian person is generally going to have a, a more well demarcated set of lesions, meaning the border between the lesion and the unaffected skin is more prominent or more noticeable, and they're gonna have more scaling and more lichenification or that rougher texture. Contrast that with the patient on the right who is white has more of that erythema pattern, less scaling, less lichenification. All right, why don't we go ahead and do another case? Um, and like I said, we will have time for questions and discussion at the end. So just hold on to everything for now, okay? Um, so now we have a 27-year-old woman who presents to the emergency department with chest pain and shortness of breath. So big, broad differential for this set of symptoms. This patient has a history of arthritis. And on physical exam, you notice on her lower leg, she has this old scar that has all this purplish pigmentation around it. Uh, you also notice that lower down on that leg, there are some erythema, there's some nodules, there's some plaques. There's a lot going on here with the skin. But in the setting of concurrent chest symptoms with these skin findings, we really need to be suspicious about sarcoidosis. Okay, sarcoidosis is a common condition. Actually, it's not that common, but it's, I'll tell you a little bit more about the, um, the breakdown in a little bit. But it's a condition that does commonly develop in young adults. Um, it, black patients are going to be affected at younger ages, on average about 10 years younger. Um, and this disease causes granulomas, which are these sort of small areas of inflammation that develop all over the body. Multiple organs other than the skin can be infected or affected. And in fact, the lungs are by far the most common organ affected here. That's the case for about 95% of people. Um, so most patients are going to present with some kind of thoracic symptoms, shortness of breath, chest pain, uh, cough are very, very common. Skin involvement is a distant second um, to the lung involvement. So only about 16% of patients will have skin findings, but it's important to be aware of the multiple types of lesions that these patients can have. Most commonly, patients will have either papules or nodules. So papules, just by definition, papules are these raised lesions that are going to be less than 10 millimeters in diameter, as opposed to nodules, which are also raised but greater than 10 millimeters in diameter. Um, those do tend to be asymptomatic, so patients may not actually complain a lot about their skin um, in terms of symptoms. One characteristic finding that is known uh, and very specific to this disease is um, one that develops around scars, tattoos, and really any type of skin trauma. Um, this is known as scar sarcoidosis and typically presents as thickening of the skin in that area accompanied by either a violaceous, like purplish or erythematous discoloration. 
It can sometimes be misdiagnosed as a kid, which we will talk about a little bit later in this session, but it's really critical not to miss a diagnosis of sarcoidosis if you see this finding. The life-threatening complications of this disease develop in the lungs, so things like pulmonary emboli, pulmonary hypertension, and um, aspergillosis, or like a fungal infection in the lungs. And since we know that the lungs are affected in the vast majority of patients, if we see a skin manifestation, we really need to dig deeper to make the diagnosis quickly of sarcoid. Um, I'm sure everyone remembers Bernie Mac. He was a famous comedian and actor. Uh, he died from pulmonary complications due to sarcoidosis at age 50. So he was young. Um, I remember I, that year, I was just starting my second year of medical school when he died. And I'll be honest, I didn't really know anything about this disease at the time. I don't know if I had even heard of it before, but as you all know, and as I certainly know, um, as physicians, we are lifelong learners and it's become very important to me to educate myself about conditions I'm less familiar with, regardless of whether it's receiving national attention as sarcoid did when Bernie Mac died. All right, here's a few other examples of skin manifestations. On the left is another example of scar sarcoidosis um, where some, you see some like darkening of the skin around the scars. And this image also shows something called hyperkeratotic papules, which are these like scattered lesions with a whitish center that looks like, um, like little warts. That can happen in sarcoid. On the top right is a great example of scar sarcoidosis involving a tattoo. This one shows more reddish um, papules. Notice that they only appear in the skin that does not have any ink on it. So the inking process is what creates the um, skin reaction, the inflammation, and, and the, inked area, the inked areas where the scar is forming. So the sarcoid manifestations are gonna happen outside of that area. Um, on the bottom right then is a pretty rare finding called ichthyosiform sarcoidosis with the, the root word ichthyos meaning fish. Um, this usually appears on the lower extremities as a large sort of thin scale that has a, like a pasted on appearance. Um, it is rare, but if you see it, there is probably a 95% chance that this patient will ultimately be diagnosed with systemic sarcoidosis. So don't miss it because um, it can have implications for the patient's uh, future health and well being. All right, let's talk about the disparities associated with sarcoidosis. There are a lot of issues here. Um, what is well established from a multi-center study called the uh, Case Controlled Etiologic Study of Sarcoidosis, also known as ACCESS, there are three determinants of health that have an association with disease burden here. Socioeconomic status, race, and gender. So low-income individuals, Black people, and women are all disproportionately affected by sarcoidosis. Patients with any of these three determinants um, do have higher disease severity at the time they are diagnosed, and that is likely largely due to barriers in accessing care. Um, they also have higher hospitalizations and higher mortality. People in these three groups have higher stress in general, and that gets added to the increased stress associated with having sarcoidosis. Black people are more likely to have other organs involved besides the lungs. They're more likely to have worse pulmonary function in the long term, which can seriously affect quality of life. And in recent decades, the greatest absolute increase in mortality due to sarcoidosis has been among Black women. The, so the, the concept of intersectionality here, right? Like it's, it's sort of layered levels of oppression based on um, sort of social identities, race, gender, socioeconomic status being some examples. So black women have the highest prevalence of sarcoidosis. Uh, the, the number that I saw from a study was nearly 180 out of 100,000 population. Black women with sarcoidosis also experience lower quality of life and higher perceived discrimination compared to black men. Now, even though this disease is more prevalent among women across the board, if you look at all racial groups, it more likely affects women. But the second highest prevalence of this disease is actually in Black men, right after Black women. Um, it's about 93 out of 100,000 population for Black men. In terms of treatment, the first line therapy for sarcoidosis is steroids. And that does have the added benefit of generally being affordable and accessible for patients. But patients may have to switch to what's known as steroid sparing therapy, 
Um, so these will be immunosuppressive agents like methotrexate, for example. Um, and this might be needed if they don't tolerate steroids because of side effects or if their disease isn't being controlled by them. But think about that. Low income patients will face significant barriers in receiving steroid sparing treatment because they do have a much higher cost. And sometimes they're often limited in their availability, like certain regions may not actually have them, certain pharmacies may not stock them. A persistent problem in clinical research is poor representation of participants from minoritized groups. And despite the fact that Black people have a higher disease burden with sarcoidosis um, than other racial groups, they are typically underrepresented in clinical trials looking at medication efficacy. So our understanding of how Black patients actually respond to treatment is unacceptably limited. So we have a lot of work here to do to try and improve outcomes for these patients. All right, we're gonna move on to another case. Um, so this is a 47 year old man who presents with a sore throat and he mentions that he hasn't been able to follow up with his primary care provider in several years. Um, you do a great job of taking a thorough history, and then the patient also shows you some dark lesions under his fingernails that have been growing rapidly. It's, it's unrelated to his presentation for a sore throat. He gets treated for strep, but he shows you this finding um, because they've been growing rapidly. He's worried about it. This is very concerning for melanoma. All right, this particular finding that you see here is um, called the Hutchinson sign, so don't confuse that with the herpes zoster finding of the same name that appears on the nose. This is another type of Hutchinson sign. And this describes the development of melanoma in the proximal nail fold that widens over time. Um, Bob Marley had this. Um, he developed a lesion under one of his toenails and ultimately he died from melanoma at the age of 36 after battling it for about four years. Now this type, uh, this particular type is, is a part of a group of melanomas known as acral lentiginous melanoma, um, which develops in places like the subungual space or under the nail, as we just saw, it can occur on the palmar or plantar surfaces. And that's kind of what's shown here. Um, these are both fairly advanced as demonstrated by their size and by their extension into the subcutaneous um, tissue. Uh, acral uh, lentiginous melanoma can also present on the mucous membranes. So melanoma in general is the most aggressive type of skin cancer and survival from melanoma depends heavily on the stage of disease when it's diagnosed. Acrolentigenous melanoma only accounts for about 5% of all melanomas, but it's much more common in people of color. So what issues are at play here when we're looking at melanoma in patients with darker skin? As I just mentioned, melanoma or people of color are more likely to develop melanoma in areas that tend to not be sun exposed necessarily. This is typically the case for black and Asian patients. However, Latinx patients tend to form lesions in sun exposed areas. And that's important to know because this particular group, the Latinx patients, have experienced a sharp increase in the incidence of melanoma in recent decades. So this is something we really need to be aware of. About 30 to 40% of acrolentiginous melanoma will develop on the sole of the foot. It's thought to be related to traumatic injuries, so it can be easily missed if we're not routinely looking at patients' feet. People of color may have a lower incidence of melanoma, but they have worse outcomes compared to white patients. Patient education is crucial in identifying suspicious skin changes that should prompt them to visit their their doctor, but it's also critical that we educate healthcare professionals on the bias that leads us to be less suspicious about melanoma in darker skin patients. People of color do tend to have fewer sunburns and other problems related to ultraviolet radiation, but we tend to think of this disease as being exclusive to light skin patients, which it clearly isn't. And the lesions themselves in people of color don't consistently follow this ABCDE rule that we often use to describe the characteristics of a suspicious lesion. And this is also something that we use to risk stratify these patients, determine who needs a biopsy, et cetera. Um, so for people of color, it is, we have a lot, of learning, a lot of learning to do here because they don't necessarily follow this particular set of guidelines, these rules that we use to diagnose the rest of patients. Um, it's much more important to just be very thorough with our history, with our physical exam, look at those areas that are suspicious that may develop acral lentiginous melanoma, and also make sure that we connect patients to a dermatologist 
if there's any suspicion of melanoma. Now, as I said, the highest incidence of melanoma is among white patients, but darker skin patients consistently have worse outcomes. People of color tend to be diagnosed later when the disease is more severe and thus more difficult to treat. This is especially true for black patients who are three times more likely to have stage three or four disease at the time of diagnosis. And once again, despite hi the higher incidence in white patients, it's black men who have the lowest five-year survival from melanoma. This is a study of fourth year medical students, about 350 of them, in which um, both white and black standardized patients had this melanoma moulage applied. And in an OSCE type scenario, the patient presented with wrist pain. And the students were assessed on their ability to identify the lesion on the finger, as you can see here, identify that as possible melanoma, and appropriately counsel the patient on seeing a dermatologist and getting a biopsy. As you can see um, on the left uh, with the data that is shown, there was overall poor detection of the melanoma moulage, regardless of the patient's skin color. And while fewer students identified the lesion in black standardized patients, it ended up not being statistically significant in this study. Um, and other studies have shown similar results too. But as we've seen, there are clinically significant disparities in outcomes for patients with dark skin. So studies like this, I think are very important to inform our medical schools about the need to help students develop a keen eye for um, skin abnormalities, especially when it comes to something as aggressive as melanoma. All right, next case, we're getting there. Thank you for hanging in there with me. Uh, we have a 58 year old woman who comes into the emergency department with a, with a history of pneumonia, but presents with fever, fatigue, and dry cough. On review of symptoms, she also reports loss of smell, loss of appetite, body aches, fever, headache, um, and an itchy rash. On physical exam, you notice that she has these scattered uh, sort of papular lesions over her trunk and legs. Let's take a little bit closer look at this rash. So the, the papules are pretty easy to spot, but again, there are these slightly more subtle areas of hyperpigmentation. And even without touching the skin, it seems to have a somewhat rougher appearance to it. All right. Well, prior to 2020, our differential diagnosis would have been quite different for a patient like this, but this patient has COVID-19. What's important to know here is not just that some patients have a uh, skin findings when they're infected with COVID-19, but skin of color, what's important to know is that skin of color has been poorly represented in the growing body of literature that's been published throughout the pandemic. There was a, there was a systematic review of articles published between December 31st, 2019 and May 3rd of 2020 that found that not a single article included images of the two darkest skin tones on this uh, skin type scale that we use. So skin types five and six on this phototype scale were not seen. I'm gonna repeat that. Not a single image of the two darkest skin tones in a pandemic that is disproportionately impacting communities of color. So tragically, the inequity in our medical education is not limited to textbooks written years or decades ago. Even our current literature is falling short. But let's equip ourselves to recognize COVID-19 skin manifestations in darker skin. All right, first, I apologize in advance. Um, I got all of these images from the same paper and even in the paper the, there was some blurring and some quality issues. But as I've also said, there is just not enough of these images out there right now. So this is about the best I could do. Um, you will have access to this article in the, um, in the right resource document that will be uploaded later. All right, so our understanding of COVID-19 skin manifestations is definitely still evolving, but the current consensus is that it's the cytokine storm that directly affects the endothelium or that inner lining of the blood vessels. And this leads to a vasculitis that leads to a variety of skin findings. So we are generally going to see these skin findings during the acute phase of infection when patients have other symptoms too. Um, there are seven rash patterns that we'll see um, I'm going to just go from the top left here. So on the top left, we see something called livido reticularis, which will show us kind of like a, a lacy pattern of discoloration, usually a darker discoloration. 
Moving to the right, we see something called the psoriasiform type rash, which can look like psoriasis or even um, pityriasis rosea. Like they can even have that little uh, herald patch that develops in pityriasis rosea where it's one lesion and then suddenly there's more general lesions that pop up later. Um, the, um, the sort of characteristic finding here, which I know is hard to see on this image, but the, the lesions may have this kind of whitish scale around the edge of the lesion. And this is something called a peripheral collarette scale. Um, looking on the top right, we have a maculopapular rash, which in this particular patient has a more reddish erythematous coloring to it. Um, but you may also see hyperpigmentation or lichenification with that particular rash. Looking at the bottom left, we see there is an urticarial type. And the urticaria in this one may or may not be erythematous. They actually tend to be more flesh colored or purplish in darker skin. And then moving to the center in the bottom, we see the purpuric type, which will show these reddish or purplish lesions. The characteristic finding here is that these lesions do not blanch when you put pressure on them. They're due to these little micro hemorrhages under the skin. And so you'll notice that there is no change in the color when you try to put pressure on it. Um, and then on the far right bottom, we have a papulovesicular type, which is what we saw in our case uh, that we presented. These might look kind of like chicken pox, if I had to describe it more like a, a general viral exanthem. But again, you can see it's not necessarily erythema that predominates as a, as a visual finding. The last cutaneous finding, oops, there it is. The last cutaneous finding you might see, although this has been seen less commonly in people of color, is the chillblain-like finding. Um, this is what has been referred to colloquially as the COVID toes. Um, in people of color, it's more the swelling of the digits that you're going to see, and it's going to be more evident than erythema. So just make sure you take a look, take a feel. You can see the swelling, especially on the top of the middle toe in this picture. Um, they, they will have these sort of like blistering um, type uh, uh, look to it. And the patients may complain of pain with that as well. All right. Okay, so the skin findings associated with COVID-19 infection are important to recognize for several reasons. Number one, remember that these rashes and eruptions are due to vascular inflammation, which may complicate the patient's disease course. The purpuric rash type in particular can also rapidly progress to tissue necrosis and livid reticularis can also cause necrosis due to thrombosis or clotting of small vessels. So if you see either of these, you should also look for any areas of necrosis because that'll definitely change the patient's course. All right, number two, looking at that papulovesicular rash type, that rash is typically seen with moderate to severe disease. So if you see that, the patient may need to be hospitalized. So you just have to have a higher index of suspicion if you see that. Um, and then number three, these skin disorders are, once again, very, very itchy. So these patients need to be appropriately counseled on how to manage their symptoms, either with antihistamines, uh, topical steroids, even oral steroids in really severe cases. And that's not something we would normally do to treat COVID in the outpatient setting. Like we typically put people on steroids when they have an oxygen requirement and they need to be admitted to the hospital. But a patient with cutaneous COVID who has uncontrollable itching may need to be on oral steroids, um, even if they're being treated at home. All right, so being able to identify these rashes will really help you treat the patient properly, um, help them manage their symptoms to manage their quality of life or maximize their quality of life while they're recovering and really empower them to recognize signs of worsening infection that may be only evident on their skin and anything that should prompt them to come back to be seen again. All right, last case, you're all doing so well. Thank you for hanging in there with me. Here we have a 32 year old man who returns to the emergency department following previous head trauma. He had been treated for a scalp laceration and then developed the lesion we see here on the right. All right, so this is a keloid. Um, it is exceptionally common in patients with dark skin. Think of this as the most severe type of scar a person can develop. What's unique to keloids is that the scar tissue actually grows beyond the borders of the original wound and starts to invade the surrounding normal skin. 
which is in contrast to like a hypertrophic scar, which are sort of raised thick uh, scars that form over the original wound, but it doesn't progress beyond the borders. So keloids are much more aggressive. In my experience, patients with wounds who are likely to form keloids typically know that that's the case because they've had keloids before. This is really, really important to address at the time of wound repair because these lesions can have multiple negative impacts on patients. Keloids are about 15 times more likely to occur on dark skin. Um, like scars, they are permanent. And while they typically develop as a result of the normal scarring process, keloids are almost always itchy. Once again, over 95% of people report itching and they are often painful, like greater than 50% are gonna have pain associated with that too. They can be disfiguring. If they're in an area where clothing is rubbing against them, they can be very uncomfortable. And these symptoms, like the itching and the pain, have been shown in studies to seriously affect people's quality of life again. They can also develop spontaneously without any skin trauma at all. So imagine how frustrating that might be for a patient if they just sort of start developing these, these lesions when there was, no, there was no sort of wound to begin with. While the pathophysiology of keloids is still not entirely understood, the best evidence suggests that they develop as part of a prolonged inflammatory period during the wound healing process that leads to increased production and deposition of scar tissue components. Um, they often require multiple treatments to manage, including a specific surgical um, excision technique called an intramarginal excision, where you actually excise from within the scar rather than around it. Patients may need steroids, cryotherapy, radiotherapy, et cetera. So as you can imagine, this can create significant costs and time spent away from daily life for patients. So what do we do when we have a patient in the ED with a wound that may form a keloid? Well, there are some prophylactic techniques that will reduce that risk or can reduce that risk. One thing we really need to aim for is rapid epithelialization, meaning ensuring that the wound heals completely in the shortest possible amount of time. The longer it takes the wound to heal, the more likely it is that a keloid will form. We really need to avoid tension on the wound, and really what that requires of us is to place multiple layers of sutures, but really if you have access to a plastic surgeon, this is the, this is the thing they need to be involved with. Like this is a, this is a pretty involved wound repair. Um, now putting multiple layers of sutures ensures that each layer of the wound touches the opposite side without any dead space left over, and the wound edges have to be really well aligned. In the case of a wound that's in an area of movement, um, it's also important that we counsel patients on trying to minimize any movement of the wound edges. That may require you to say, put like a splint on an extremity if that's where the wound is, um, because that will, any movement will increase the risk for keloid formation. All right. So that's our cases. Great job, everyone. Thank you for being here. We covered a lot in this session. And like I said, we have plenty of time for questions and discussion. Um, in closing, I just want to encourage everyone to go follow this medical student who's also a, a medical illustrator on social media. Um, his name is Chitabere Ebay. And he recently, back in 2021, like completely broke the internet in the best possible way with this illustration of a Black pregnant person and their fetus. Um, that widely circulated on social media. Um, I, I just remember seeing comments from a lot of people that so many people remarked that they've never seen anything like this before, which really speaks to the lack of representation in medical illustration as well. But it also touched so many people given the, the really significant and terrible disparity that we see with maternal and infant mortality in black patients. So if you're on either Twitter or Instagram, here's his handle, go follow him. It's actually his birthday today too. So Wish him a happy birthday if, if you can. Um, I think it's so important that we take every opportunity to see clinical images and illustrations of dark skin, both because it helps us be better as healthcare professionals, but also I think it's great to just really appreciate the beauty and also the importance of diversity in our visual learning. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now because that's, that's, that's the bulk of the presentation there. Um, we do have plenty of time for questions or discussion. Does anyone have any questions, comments? Um, you can unmute yourself. You can use the chat, whatever works for you. I'm totally here for you. I'll give it a few minutes. Um, if there's nothing, we can end early as well. But what kind of, um, did anything kind of come up with you? Anything new that you learned that you didn't know before? What do you think?
Um, I just want to say thank you for this presentation. Um, it's so needed. As a Black woman, I can definitely speak to this about how things present differently. And I think going throughout med school and not seeing these images in the forefront. And there's been a shift recently, but you highlighted it so well with these case presentations. And it was very much easy to follow along. So thank you. I really hope you get to do this again on a larger platform because it's definitely needed. Uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I mean, I, I love all feedback. Like I, my, my background is in medical education and that's like, you know, we kind of joke about it, like feedback for everything. Right. But positive words are always so, so um, appreciated as well. Um, so thank you very much for that. And I'd be more than happy to give a talk like this again. So feel free to reach out. I'll actually drop my email address in the chat. Um, so feel free to reach out to me anytime. Questions, comments, want to talk about anything, residency, et cetera, I'm, I'm here for you. Right. Any other questions, comments? Yeah, yeah. hi. Hi. I love How you, you doing? That was great. Thank you. Um, so since I'm a PGY 33, <laughs> this type of thing was not something, like, I've never had a lecture like this at all. Is this something that you had to dig out on your own? Or is it something that you found a partner with? How did you learn this? Well, I will say um, in trying to decide how to come up with the, the structure of this talk, um, a lot of it was looking to see what, um, what visual sort of resources were already out there, which I will be honest, it's, it's actually not that much when, when we're looking at like, um, you know, like uh, sort of free, basically like foam resources, like things that are easily accessible online. So I did speak to some of the other Jedi um, section members who directed me towards some resources. Like there's one that I'll include that's, it's called brownskinmatters.com. And it's basically a blog that has this growing list of images in patients with dark skin, and it's like a whole list of uh, specific medical conditions. Um, there's a couple social media accounts that are also called Brown Skin Matters. Um, I have found that, and also in working with Kara, um, who really came up with the, um, the, the most common issues that we need to be really aware of. And so she was the one that really dug into the medical literature, found the studies, and the studies that were really specific to why we need to examine this differently. Um, for the groups that are more affected by these different diseases. So there was a lot of PubMed searching in there. Um, but I will tell you like the, the amount of, um, it, for me, it was, I, I had a much harder time finding uh, visual materials. So there are papers that have photographs of patients in there, but like, it would be amazing if there was like an enormous online repository of images to learn from this. Um, because, you know, most textbooks, like I said, just don't have it. So yeah, a lot of Google searching, a lot of PubMed searching to try and find images that were good quality and that really kind of um, demonstrated the findings well. Um, like I said, I will provide that um, in, a, in a document to follow up. This Kara here or a different Kara? No, it's, 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 it's Kara here. <laughs> Hi, Kara here. How are you doing, Kara? <laughs> Hi, Lois. How are you? Good. I thought that that was excellent. I don't know if we have something like that in emergency medicine, but um, as a medical educator, there's a variety of journals out there. You've already put the cases together. I think that there would be interest in, in something like this. Yeah, this worked out really cool. Yeah, and like I said, I mean, I went through and I mean, I read all those papers that Kara had found and used to um, create the material for these slides. And I will, you know, those articles are, are great because they really do focus very specifically on people of color and really highlighting a lot of the, the limitations that we have, but also um, giving some direction in terms of how to, how to care um, for patients. So you know, my, my hat is definitely off to you, Kara, because I think that was probably a lot of work for you. <laughs> we should do more with that. I just came from court, yeah. so multiplying scholarship is, is the thing right now. Yes. I thought that was Yes, excellent. I agree. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? Anyone else have questions, comments?
All right. Well, if there isn't anything else, like I said, there's my email address there. Um, this uh, session will be made available on the AAEM Jedi website, usually within 48 hours. Um, there will also be a PDF document that has all the articles that were used to create this talk. And then, um, like I mentioned, the um, the online resources that I was able to come up with that I thought were good quality uh, sort of learning resources, um, both in sort of websites and also social media accounts. All right. Uh, Kristen, do you know how many people are looking at doing looking at that recording? I don't. Um, I mean, we have we have 16 people in attendance here. Um, I'd, ha I'd have to follow up. I that might be a question for Kathy about who might watch the recording later on, but it's but it's available for. Um, yeah, I'm wondering if you may want to hold it and okay. uh, put it through as adorable for CME to get a wider audience. Um, and okay. um, I can help you with that because just to watch is one thing and people will do that, but to get a, uh, it's probably a 0.5, depending on all this, um, you might get a wider audience being able to put CME on it. It was amazing. Great. I agree. Yeah, I, I would. I would totally do the work in support of that because um, I mean, I agree. I mean, I'm happy to do this type of talk um, here and there, but I mean, I think something like this probably does need to be out there to really help us kind of shift um, shift our understanding of, of skin specifically. Um, yeah. All right, well, thank you everyone so much for attending this session. Um, we won't be having a session in April due to the scientific assembly, but we'll be back on May 10th for a session about racial bias and pain assessment with Dr. Kristen Smith as our speaker. So please join us for that. Uh, you can register on the AAEM JEDI website for that um, session. Um, like I said, we'll be posting um, the document with resources for you. So you should be able to see that in the next couple of days. Um, and I think that does it for me, all right? Thank you everyone. This concludes our program for tonight. Good night. Thank you.